in the interest of making it a more powerful movement um, uh, and also uh, increasing the likelihood that underlying causes of the uh, more surface level dysfunction of climate change uh, get addressed. And uh, I'm I'm sobered by the difficulty of uh, uh, bringing uh, minority perspectives into existing white uh, cultures and structures, even if they're just, you know, activist groups. And so I, I'm, I've joined a social justice discussion self-education group uh, as part of the Conscious Elders Network. And um, so I, I'm I'm doing, you know, as somebody who's 70 years old, I'm doing uh, uh, some surprising self education uh, to me is surprisingly eye-opening self-education. I thought of myself as being sensitive and well-informed on many of these issues, being in a cross-racial marriage uh, for one reason. But uh, last night I just listened on tape to uh, Ta-Nehisi's uh, Coates's uh, Between Me and, and the World, a letter to his son about what it means to grow up black in America, which is a just really uh, um, deeply unsettling perspective. And I realized that in the wake of all of the, the shootings that have taken place, uh, but mostly by police uh, in, in the recent past, uh, I think I've got this, the issue of um, racial injustice has my attention in a way that it hadn't had for a long time. And I think I'm realizing the extent to which my own uh, lenses have gotten clouded over by just complacency and also my own white privilege. And so I think, uh, although this, I'm, I'm not, I haven't lost sight of the link to dialogue, but I'm, I'm just trying to think out loud. Uh, I think what I'm realizing is that in order to engage in meaningful dialogue uh, with people with other perspectives, I in some ways need to, um, to clean my glasses and, uh, you know, fine tune my own organs of perception and uh, do a, do uh, do some, some more compassionate projection of myself into their shoes. I'm in. Thanks, Grady. Carol. I, I, I couldn't be, um, more sobered by what Grady just said, because climate change is probably um, not the highest thing on my list. But I've been working on the um, social aspects of sustainability and have been powerfully influenced by work in Cincinnati by Victor Garcia, a trauma surgeon whose life's work has become ending poverty and the whole racial divide in order to not have to operate on children who have gunshot wounds. And I so identify with the, the self-learning and um, how sobering this is. I've come from five years of work with schools in very impoverished communities in South Africa, and that was the beginning of my education. And I, I really am struck by how I got here to this, um, I guess not accidentally, and I'm very grateful. So, um, Grady, one more time, we've come together through organizational learning from time to time. It seems like now we're at the next one with Conscious Elders. Yeah. So thank you all. I'm completely in and listening. Thank you, Carol. Okay, Michael. Yes, thank you. Um, well, my problem is I have such a sense of urgency and the need uh, around the need to systemically change rather than just locally that I have a hard time uh, getting into local issues. My, my perspective is global, and I find that people recognize climate change as a problem, 
but they don't believe they can do anything about systemic change and the whole climate change issues, so they focus on local issues that can get results but will not change the basics. Well, my focus, as I mentioned in the Interfaith Caucus, is on uh, addressing systemic causes of climate change, which uh, for all practical purposes is fossil fuels being emitted by huge corporations that uh, don't allow themselves to be regulated. And uh, my belief that uh, we uh, are capable of getting uh, corporations regulated by amending the Constitution to eliminate their person personhood and money as speech. But it's a big concept for people to grab onto. And so they go back to the local changes they can do. So what I've been changing in my presentation is partially as a result, again, of the Pope's encyclical, uh, talking about uh, the seventh generation of the Iroquois uh, and our need to be thinking about our descendants. And uh, what are they going to say if in three generations they look back and say, what were you doing or why didn't you do more about uh, climate change? So the love for our descendants and the love for the planet itself is what I'm feeling uh, needs to be my focus, but I really don't know how to make it persuasive so that it uh, uh, encourages people to act on something as huge as systemic change to uh, allow us to turn climate change around. And it's an ongoing challenge that I'm, I'm seeking uh, to find solutions to. Stop. Thanks, Michael. John Kelly. Hi. Hi. Um, so when I get into conversations with people, they are, they're all over the map. I mean, I, I run into people who are completely depressed, you know, and say it's, it's all over, it's too late. Um, and other people who say, well, there's something that can be done, but I can't do it because I'm powerless. And another view that says, well, there's all these new technologies and they're all coming on really fast and they're going to solve the problem. So, so I don't need to think about it. And, you know, obviously I'm not going to use this word casually. I'm not going to just drop it in the conversation, but if it's emotionally appropriate, I might say that, you know, it's, it's arrogant to be depressed because that assumes you know the causality more than we could know. It's also arrogant to think that you're powerless. And it's also arrogant to think that the solution's already here because all of those things overstate what it's possible for us to know. And I have had people say, I think we're, you know, I think it could be over. And, and, and we've actually had a conversation about, so if, if, if the world is going to end in our lifetime, do you want to be, well, how do you want to relate to that emotionally, spiritually? And then sometimes we've come to the point of view that says, even, first of all, we can't know that that's the case, but even if that's happening, we want to be doing what we can to, uh, you know, save, save what we can. That, that is the stance we want to take. And um, for the folks who have said, well, I can do something locally, but, you know, it's not really going to have an effect. Globally, we sometimes have a conversation that talks about the hidden leverage between the local and the global. And again, depending on their background, if they're not spiritual, that leverage sometimes is a conversation about authenticity and how that can multiply the effects of the local. And if they do have a spiritual orientation, then sometimes we have a conversation about that and how, again, from a, from a position of humility, you can't know uh, what the effects of what you're doing locally are going to uh, have, but um, it's quite possible they will have an effect globally. Thank you. Thank you, John. Rosa. Mm. Yes. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, what are we learning about engaging in or facilitating climate change conversations? Well, I, too, feel strongly about it being part of a larger picture. And I feel very heartened to have spent the last weekend in a group of people who were talking about fascism 
and how the national conversation that we are having in many ways is are we going to elect a fascist president and become as happened in germany uh hitler was democratically elected um and so one of the things for me where it connects with this is that I feel that fascism tends to play on people's fears in order to get people to want to um, support a strong father figure. And so I feel that this whole thing of um, touching on the real dangers of climate change, but at the same time really portraying a vision of uh, optimism and hope that there, we don't know what the future holds, but that there are things that we can do about it, um, is very, even more important given the, uh, the many sources of fear and terror that are present in our society right now. And with that, I'm in. Thanks, Rosa. Marty. Marty, you're on mute. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So I'm just bubbling from um, a lot of the things that have already been mentioned. Um, in terms of what I've learned, I, I feel that I've learned different things about bringing my facilitation skills forward in climate activism by the work I do inside organizations. I work a lot with Citizens Climate Lobby, and then the work I do in the community trying to engage other people. And to me, they're really different problems and, and, and challenges and learnings that I've had. And some of the things that have been mentioned already speak to some of them. But I'll mention one thing new. In terms of my work with people that already have kind of gone through the trial by fire of accepting the predicament we're in and then making the decision that I'm going for it. I'm making a, a, a commitment. They're amazing people like everyone that's in this call. Um, but what I find in organizations and different projects I've been in, and not just Citizens Climate Lobby, it's 350 work, it's other work, is that there's very little valuing of process. It's very much so action oriented that trying to allow more time for groups to share and maybe plumb a little deeper onto uh, insights about what we're trying to accomplish and what's the best short term way to accomplish it. Things that um, I've done a lot with my clients on, um, I find a lot of impatience. So I'm, I'm learning that I, I'm finally finding ways to get traction inside organizations, but that's still a challenge for me and a, a key learning area. In terms of um, trying to be a, a messenger of climate hope, um, I have to say, I learned something right in this call, and that's a new phrase that I really want to use, and it's climate emergency. Two people mentioned it in their introductions, and I've been looking for a different phrase that captures the moment, and I think that's it for me. I really feel that that's a, a good phrase to, to use. Um, I am thinking of developing in some of my outreach work, um, what I would call kind of like our demons in addressing climate change. And they get at some of the things I think that John was talking about, but the fact that um, there's real barriers to people wanting to, not wanting to, but there's real barriers to people that aren't already committed to acting on this issue, to them shifting into a space where they've said, I can live with this issue in my day-to-day -day life. And I think there's a lot of barriers around um, the things that John mentioned. People feel that, who am I to think I can make a difference? Our democracy is so broken now. I work a lot in political advocacy, and a lot of people don't really feel they have political power anymore. Um, there are people who feel it's really other people's jobs because I... I am too busy or so there's these kind of barriers so I'm doing a lot of thinking about how to frame um, the need for action and the, the hope that we have when we act together because I am choosing to believe we do have time to make a huge difference um, 
And someone said earlier, you know, DOMA, how it, tur it tipped so fast. I, I truly believe it's the climate emergency heats up, it's, and we see it heating up all the time at a quicker pace. There's going to be a tipping point of action. And I feel that it's, it's people like us are part of the, the net that's going to be there for other people who finally say, gosh, I think I have to pay more attention to this. So that's some of my initial thoughts on our dialogue. Thank you, Marty. Share and join. You need to unmute yourself. Your talk reminds me of a call this morning with a man whose focus is um, in uh, parental bereavement. And he's coming to the area and I'm encouraging him to think of societal bereavement. And I think that that's another thing that is going on is that the figures, the institutions, the beliefs that we've held are crumbling under our feet and we feel it and, and it's very frightening. It's very disturbing for most of us. Uh, and I'm looking for my own compassion in what, how that shows up in people's stress and their uh, behaviors, et cetera. I think we're seeing that, uh, at least that's my my hypothesis. I want to go into something else, however, in what I'm learning engaging in climate change conversations. And I'll set the stage by telling you I visited my sister in Houston last month. And I was with a number of really very fine people, some of them in the oil industry. They don't talk about climate change because they don't believe it exists. Some of them still think it's a conspiracy, as does a friend of mine here who's a graduate of MIT. So my deep learning, folks, is my response to people who don't believe in climate change and how I respond to them. So what happened to me in Houston is I initially became, well, I was shocked and I was depressed. And I noticed I was choosing not to get into an argument about it. And um, then I've had another conversation with a man who completely dismissed me when I talked about climate change. And I did try to level my response to him without, I mean, while still bringing it up. So those are two different scenarios. One, I chose not to push it. In regard for respecting some people, will not choose to go here. And that's my own spiritual path, is people have a right to choose. And what that means for me is just like when I run into things that don't work or people who don't agree with me, is I bless them and move on and say namaste because I put my energy in the people and the excitement and the possibilities that are coming together. I won't go into detail about this, but some of you've heard of me refer to the Maharishi effect, the research about TM in five cities in the US, where by TMers coming together and meditating, they were able to lower crime rate, et cetera. So that's a principle of research that has been intriguing to me for a number of years. And we've actually been using this phenomenon is that it only takes the square root of 1% of a population to shift the consciousness. And either that or something else is working. That's what I'm buying into. So that brings me a lot of peace to think I don't have to worry about global. I don't have to worry about those folks in Houston. I just have to be on this call today and look how many of us are having a coherence and looking at what that square root of 1% is in different pockets of my work. So that's what I'm learning about conversations about climate change. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon Joy. Libby. Don't forget to unmute. There you go. Thank you. 
Um, first, let me just appreciate being here with all of you. It's really water to a thirsty soul to hear your thinking. I appreciate it very much. Um, forgive me, I, my memory is so bad, I'm going to look at some notes I was taking as people were speaking. Um, I think both John and Marty mentioned this question of encountering people's different defenses around processing this. And I'm sure many of you know of the work of Robert Lifton, uh, who did work around psychic numbing that had to do with the dropping of the bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki quite a long time ago. Um, what I decided to do with that in terms of public presentations um, is, is to speak directly to it. Um, so I have done a number of presentations where I talk using the metaphor that our house is on fire and how would people react if a house was on fire. They wouldn't, you know, study commissions. They wouldn't discuss what, who caused it. They wouldn't do all these things. They would actually begin to act, right? particularly if their children were in the building. Um, and then head into a, a discussion and talk about those defenses that we all have. And what I, what I tell them is, from my standpoint, because I'm often talking to people who probably are in the faith communities and, you know, those, the allies, so to speak, is that um, it's been my experience that the, the challenge is not really with the people who deny the existence of climate change. It's with those of us who know it's happening and aren't, like everybody says, aren't doing anything. So I actually started to catalog an inventory of my friends' ways of deflecting this reality over time. And I'm talking affluent, educated, middle class or upper middle class white people. I work at a university. Those aren't my only friends, but there's a lot of them. Scientists, right, even. And, and I spell them out for them. And I tell them what mine are. You know, I have a defense system that will say, well, when the worst of this hits, I'm going to, I'll be dead. Or, you know, um, you know, that I don't want to look at this because my middle class trajectory is supposed to play out differently. And this, this just is blowing my storyline away of how my life is supposed to unfold. And, you know, in the same way that a war might. Anyway, for whatever it's worth, it does seem like naming our shared uh, ways of deflecting this really terrifying thing by naming it, it really allows people to start to realize that it's not just them who's doing this and they're, you know, they're not on their own just doing it and that other people share those same defenses and that they are in fact defenses, right? Not true. Um, you know, that I have friends who will say, well, I can't think about this because I have children and I can't bear it. Someone else will say, I don't have any children, so I don't need to think about it. You know, I mean, they go on and on and you guys outlined a whole bunch from technology will solve it. Somebody else has got it. I can't do anything. I don't matter. You know, blah, blah. So that's perhaps useful to people. And um, in the process of doing that, I constantly allow and build in opportunities for processing, like people have said, right, the need to try to absorb this in some way. And um, I don't necessarily, I'm sure many of you know of Joanna Macy's work on despair and empowerment and how the grieving process is so necessary for us to keep functioning in this arena. But a lot of people aren't, of course, comfortable with that level of emotionality. But even giving people a chance to process in pairs or in threes or whatever, and to tell them that a lot of that is to help their thinking continue, you know, not just their feelings, but, you know, just so that we can keep talking with each other um, and build them in regularly so people can kind of absorb what's being said and not have to just sit there and listen about it. it seems to really also help people stay somewhat empowered. So there's that. Um, there's just the simple fact I tell a lot of people that just talking about, just calling this weather climate change as opposed to weird weather, <laughs> you know, is something that everybody can do, even the most terrified, you know, or the, the most um, disempowered people. I will say to them, at the very least, if we start calling it what it is, if you just call it that, not hot weather, um, that actually really does contribute to a cultural shift in the conversation. And, um, and there's a book, I haven't gotten hold of it, but a friend of mine has it, that, that has documented through research what um, helps people persist in actions that move towards sustainability. Um, and one of them is that if you get someone to do a small action, then they are much more willing to do a medium action, right? Or a larger action. So I think possibly encouraging people simply to do something as basic as calling it climate change breaks a little bit of a barrier for some people to then sort of move into the next place. Um, that book is worth noting. I don't know the title, I'm so sorry, but there is a book out about research-based evidence on, on what helps people move on climate change. And one of those things, for example, is making a public commitment. Um, one of those things is being followed up on later by somebody checking to see if they actually did the thing. You know, one of them is this business of taking a small step first and then a larger step. So 
um, that could be useful to people. Um, I'm just going to keep going until you stop me. Um, I am a musician in my other life, um, and so I am uh, really committed to the use of music, uh, particularly, I mean, the other arts are critical as well, but there is something uh, particular about music in that it hits us on every level, physical, spiritual, mental, emotional, and really does empower people. Think civil rights, think South Africa, think you know, all the other movements we know of that have been um, really activated by music and empowered and connected. People feel connected when they sing together or even in the presence of music. So I put music liberally in whatever I do, wherever I can, and certainly humor, which is hard to find <laughs> on climate, but it's out there. And I have a few things, you know, the John Olivers of the world, bless their hearts. Um, you know, you can find those YouTube things from them and some other folks. And I, I really think that helps enormously. So, I mean, I operate on the premise that the, the heavier the material, the lighter my tone needs to get to keep people functioning, um, kind of with a balance of their attention on the hard stuff and the easy, easier stuff. So there's that. Um, for those of you in the faith communities, you probably know of this. I mentioned my friend earlier, Kathleen Dean Moore. She has an anthology out called Moral Ground ethical action for a planet in peril. And it involved um, folks from all over the world, from the Pope to a 12 year old girl being asked the ethical reasons why we owe it to move on these issues. Um, and they have been used by faith communities around um, the world as well as other people, but to launch discussions about climate change. And so that's another mechanism that works for people, right? Is to have a shared text and to launch off of that. So they don't have to be talking about their own opinions all the time. They can refer to the opinions on the page. Um, I work extensively in indigenous modes of dialogue and deliberation. And um, so there's lots of great ideas that they have for how to conduct conversations with one another, even if we really disagree with one another. And I'll just refer to them. We can talk more about it if anybody's interested. But, you know, we are now in a state of sustained emergency, permanent emergency. It will never go away. Um, and that is so psychically horrifying to most of us, right? And, and uh, me too, right? How are we going to go forward when the emergency never stops? I think part of the reason people have such a hard time acting on this one is it never stops. You don't win it, and you won't. You know, we've already put into the atmosphere more than, you know, it's not going to go well, even if we stop today, right? It's still going to be hard. So one of the great things about indigenous communities is that they have survived together for thousands of years, both in harsh conditions, just environmentally before, but they've also survived under genocidal oppression now for quite a while, as have African American communities and other communities that people have mentioned. And so they have the skills, a lot of them, to help us figure out how do you keep moving together under that kind of duress, you know, over a system period of time. Um, I guess I'll quit there. I, I, there's more here, but... Um, that's probably enough out of me. We'll come back around to you. Thank Thanks. you so much. James. Did you call for David? James. Do you like, are, are you okay. a or James? James Weber. Yeah, and you're, you're on mute. I'm here. Okay. Are you a Jim or a James? Jim. Jim, okay. Uh, okay. So, uh, <clears throat> building on, uh, what Libby uh, mentioned, and amongst all her other great ideas, uh, I <coughs> have uh, I experienced a um, a change in uh, in my life when I attended a, a conference in on workshop uh, Joanna Macy workshop last February, and uh, I uh, <coughs> and I. Um, ended up uh, learning uh, the, the process called the work that reconnects. And uh, I have uh, used it personally, uh, which ended up uh, in a lot of replacement windows and storm doors and, and even trying to do solar uh, panels. But so what I have done and what a my finding in terms of how to have these conversations is uh, to take a book, and the particular book is Active Hope by Joanne Macy, 
and uh, uh, and a chap named uh, John Stone, and uh, go through a chapter by chapter, week by week, with a group. And in doing so, we are uh, developing ways of dealing with the angst and horror of this subject, mm -hmm. and uh, at the same time, learning how to facilitate each other because we, we, we rotate facilitator, uh, and then learning, and we hope to, and are working on becoming facilitators of uh, active hope uh, in our broader community. So that's where we're going. Thank you. Great, Jim, thanks. Rick. Okay, I'm back. I'm, I'm on the phone, as you can tell, so you can't see my mute or unmute on the video. Um, the, I think you can see my video, though. You can't? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh, great comments. I've been taking lots of notes. Thank you. I'm, uh, a couple of things have stuck for me from what I've been listening to. Um, I want to, several people have brought up the word hope, hopefulness. And I think that's very important to me and how we do this work and how we engage others in this, these conversations and thinking. Um, and, and I was really struck by Grady's comment about, um, my, my note was that we're all in. We've got to make sure that we're all in in this. We've got to make sure that we're reaching out um, to those who are typically ignored in the society. This is not that, you know, you don't make the environment for just the, the white rich folks. Um, and as we see in like coming out of Paris, we're not going to get there if we don't raise the standard of living and the well-being of those in the developing world. If they, you know, just because we got here first and we burned all the coal and so forth, um, what are they going to do? How do they get their, their ability to live their lives well? And so we have to address that. But of course, that even comes down to, you know, so I live in Boston. You know, there are communities here that are, uh, you know, threatened by uh, climate issues in different ways and are always um, lacking resources. So if we come up with more expensive ways to do things that might be good for the environment, what does that mean to them? How can they participate? So those were a couple of things. The other thing I was, I was uh, sort of listening to and remembering also that I wanted to bring to this was that they were talking about there's several comments around what I, the theme of what I would call conversations where we stay open. And I'm thinking about conversations that I've seen in the environmental movement, which didn't stay open, even though they were extremely well intentioned and very good and contain some very good ideas. I'm thinking specifically of the natural step, which some of you are probably familiar with, as it came to this country, not as it was originally developed. As it was originally developed in Europe, it was a very open and evolving country, a, a conversation. What I saw when it came here was it became more like, well, here are the steps. What do you need to know? Let's implement them. And that was too prescriptive. I've also seen attempts to adopt a model called transition towns that grew up in England primarily. And again, it was sort of brought here like, well, here's the cookbook, here's the prescription, get your town together to do these things and these steps. I don't think that works. Um, so we need to stay open and find ways to engage people in conversations and in those conversations need to be people who come from all backgrounds, whether they've only been here for a year, whether they're coming from uh, situations of uh, difficult poverty, uh, how do we, or lack of education, lack of job opportunities, how do we make this work for us all here locally? And then how do we keep engaged the world and how do we make sure this works for the developing world as well as us? So those are what my thoughts, thank you. I'm still thinking. <laughs> Thanks, Rick. Susan. Hi there, everyone. Thank you for um, these insightful comments. Um, I've been thinking uh, lately about the issue of, of those who are naysayers to whether 
there's climate change or not. And I've been thinking about, in terms of having dialogue and discussion and, and deliberation, that perhaps it would make sense to um, maybe not debate about whether or not there really is climate change. Um, what we do see factually is that there's in worst hurricanes ever, floods, sea level rise. I mean, there's those sorts of things that whether it's a result of some kind of climatic change or whether it's just El Nino or weather patterns in the moment, that's really what, if we can focus on that on what, on, as opposed to whether or not these kind of, you know, huge changes and shifts are due to climate change, I think we may get further along so that we're not spending our important resources, energy, et cetera, in, in fighting the debate, but rather in let's just move forward. And one way that, you know, when I talk to people individually in terms of the people who feel like there's nothing I can do, you know, it's too late, we're doomed, or whatever it might be, actually there's quite a lot that every individual can do. You know, things like turn off the lights you leave when you leave a room. Um, you buy a, you know, if you can, or you drive a, a an energy efficient car that gets twice as much gas mileage. You lower the thermostat, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I just went online to my uh, state in Maryland to see what they're recommending. And there's a whole list of reducing energy use. Um, so if we individually can do very, very small things, it reminds me of what Mother Teresa said. And she said, well, you may not feel like there's a lot getting done, but everybody puts a drop in the bucket and the bucket fills up and gets full. And um, I have a dear friend that I would like to connect you with, Libby, who's in Anchorage, who's doing a lot of work on climate change. Her name is Robin Bronin. And um, she has actually advocated on Huffington Post that if we all didn't drive our car, for just one day in the, in the year, one day, it would make a difference on greenhouse gas emissions. So I do think there is there is lots that we individually can do, and certainly all of us as representative people that really care about what's going to happen, what is happening, that kind of communication to people, which I think even on a very individual level is the possibility of giving people some hope. Um, one other thing I'd like to just mention is, is my interest. Um, I do a lot of work with the United Nations, and I'm extremely interested in what people not from the West do to adapt to climate change. Um, again, Libby, I know you mentioned indigenous uh, ways of coping with all kinds of um, awful things and atrocities that have happened. Um, but I think there's probably some very uh, low technology, uh, adaptive kinds of practices that people, you know, sometimes the people with the least resources are the most resourceful. So I personally am interested very much in that. Um, the UNFCC, which is the group that uh, was very involved in the Paris talks, um, has some information on what indigenous practices are going on around the world to deal with it. So I think we from the West would really um, have a lot to learn from from what others are doing in the world. And i um, happy to hear what anybody has to say if, if you'd like to respond, um, particularly around the debate around whether there, if this is all caused by some climate change or not. Thank you. Oh, so many things I wanna jump in on. So I see Leanne Nurse has joined us. Hi, Leanne. Are you there? I don't see your picture. Oh, sorry. No, my camera is not working because I'm calling from my job. So I was just able to download the um, software, but the camera is not working thanks to your tax dollars. Gotcha. All right, Leanne, you're on. Nice to have you here. Um, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to participate. And um, I'm really humbled by the range of, of deep experience and commitment from all the participants. Um, as some of you know, I've been in government for it'll be 28 years on Friday, but 
based on that and other work and the last three years of it working on climate adaptation specifically, um, I have been very, very deeply challenged both in terms of shifting my own frames, in terms of beginning to appreciate the extreme degree of resistance and fear that people are either in touch with or not. And in the little world that I occupy here, even though I'm working for a researcher, working with a researcher who was part of the initial IPCC research group and is getting, well, he got today the, they call it the Presidential Rank Award for service. Um, it kind of puts him in the top 2% of feds. I am very, very deeply concerned specifically about the younger colleagues of mine who have extensive technical understanding of the physical science of climate change, a couple of whom are working on our side of the fence in as much as they have some experience either as somewhere along the range of dialogue and deliberation. So they have experience in methodology and they know how to apply it. Um, what I'm learning is that my most recent dream, which is to get the physical science people and the social science people in the same room together, is going to be a hell of a lot harder than I thought on one hand. And on the other hand, because of these kinds of conversations, this particular conversation, I am restored in my hope that we can make progress. I just also wanted to mention that this issue of motivation, um, what it is that is motivating me at this time is very different from what motivated me a couple of years ago. And I am no longer just fearful, but I'm fearful and hopeful simultaneously. Most days a little bit more hope than fear, but not always. So the process of um, having a safe space in which to consider the catastrophically overwhelming nature of what we're trying to do is very helpful for me. And my pledge is to get a working camera next month so I can be fully present. I can see all of you, but to be fully present and to um, try to offer some of the um, experiences that are unfolding, but also to ask some pretty pointy questions of some of you because of the differences that I hear in people's experience. And, and so it's not so important to draw lines around those differences, but for me right now, um, I'm trying really hard to listen, to learn about those differences, how you ascribe value to the differences in their experiences, and then collectively what this process that we're going through, uh, what it will mean to the future of uh, the species and, and more immediately of the pieces of the work that we're doing. So thank you very much. Thanks, Leanne. And for those who don't know Leanne, she uh, currently is working in the EPA. Um, so th thanks, Leanne. Ben. Ben, we can't hear you. Sorry, had my phone muted as well as Zoom. Uh -huh. um, just, just want to start with a quick side observation that nobody, I don't think, has mentioned COP21, which seems quite interesting and remarkable to me. Maybe it's a testament to how much of a koan that uh, those events are being, on the one hand, clearly something many people are celebrating and also something that even within the own, their own documents, you know, is, is identified as falling way short of what's needed. So often I'm seeing people both celebrating and, you know, bemoaning those together, it's, it's an interesting mix. Um, <clears throat> and I'm in both camps. Uh, I, I've been, uh, I, I founded a weekly discussion group here in, in Newtown that, that has a, it's mostly liberal progressive ties. So we've had a few um, conservatives that have been steady participants. This meets more or less weekly, a little less often of late. Um, 
And last night we met, and I was astonished to hear that our, our resident Republican, who's been, I don't know if he's been an outright climate denier, but he certainly hasn't felt particularly compelled to think of climate as, a, as an emergency, uh, has been reading Tom Friedman's Hot, Flat, and Crowded, and he's converted by Tom. <laughs> um, and he's only halfway through the book, and I said, so I asked, I said, Paul, well, so what do you think we ought to do now that you, you know, you agree with us how serious this is? He said, well, I have to finish the book. I don't know yet. Um, okay, and, uh, and the election, you know, are you still planning to vote Republican? Well, yeah, I, even Trump, who I don't like, I would vote for over Hillary or Bernie. So, you know, it's, it's a conundrum, but I'm, I'm still sort of hopeful there. And I'm thinking about, you know, the point others have made that there are other reasons besides addressing climate to do a lot of the things that do address climate. And maybe that's where somebody like Paul um, comes into play. I, I watched a TEDx talk from uh, a guy named Chuck Collins, who I also know is with the investment, uh, the, the Institute for Policy, um, specifically addressed at the 1% that he identified himself as being a part of and saying, you know, this is the moment in history to stop st saving your money and invest it in, in local resilience and thriving, which is directly related, you know, to, to climate. Um, he comes out of the transition town movement, by the way, and transition Jamaica Plain. So I heard some questions about transition. I can, I can tell you that despite it, it, it's, it's alive and well and, and morphing. And, and uh, of course, Sharon Joy would know that as well. Um, so it's interesting him and then thinking about Paul, and here's this call to you know, invest in the local economy, including locally owned renewable energy, right? I think Paul would totally get behind that. Um, the other thing, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just resonating very much with, with all the different conversations about emotions and fear and grief and, and you know, the despair versus hope and, and, and all that, and, and, um, and also the social justice piece and the observation that, you know, there are people who have been oppressed and, and you know, faced genocide for, for generations who know how to deal with this better than we do. I, I think that's, that's true. Uh, and we have a lot to learn from them. And, and, you know, I, I've been working with the, a little bit with the Climate Justice Alliance and their Our, Our Power campaign, which is about putting those most, you know, oppressed and marginalized communities and the leaders there in front, you know, letting them lead the front lines in front. And, um, and it bridges both the local and the systemic in a, in a pretty powerful and beautiful way. Um, one of the, 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 the coordinator of that campaign is going to be one of our conversation starters on Thursday. And, um, and, and another person who's called that out beautifully and, and mentioned movement generation and, and, and climate justice alliance is Naomi Klein, um, you know, I think who's identified climate as the through line that brings all of these different systemic pieces together. Uh, and that, you know, we get to solve them all. We get like the cartoon I shared before, you know, we get to create a world that works for all potentially in the name of solving climate, you know. Um, but the other thing that Klein said, and I know some of you have heard this quote, it goes back to the piece about, about grief and, you know, and fear. I, you know, I, I do hear people are afraid to talk about how afraid they are. You know, they're afraid to say anything other than that they're hopeful. Um, and I think that's problematic. And, and, and Klein has this wonderful passage in, in her book, This Changes Everything, that I'm just going to close by reading. I, I just read only the last sentence of this in a conversation earlier today brought somebody else, just, just broke, you know, broke him wide open because they were, I think we're all feeling this, this grief so much. And um, she says... Um, a great deal of the work of deep social change involves having debates during which new stories can be told to replace the ones that have failed us. Because if we are to have any hope of making the kind of civilizational leap required of this fateful decade, we will need to start believing once again that humanity is not hopelessly selfish and greedy, the image ceaselessly sold to us by everything from reality shows to neoclassical economics. Paradoxically, this may also give us a better understanding of our personal climate inaction allowing many of us to view past and present failures with compassion rather than angry judgment. What if part of the reason so many of us have failed to act is not because we are too selfish to care about an abstract and seemingly far off problem, but because we're utterly overwhelmed by how much we do care? And what if we stay silent, not out of acquiescence, but in part because we lack the collective spaces in which to confront the raw terror of ecocide? The end of the world as we know it, after all, is not something anyone should have to face on their own. Thank you, Ben. I love it. Every time you read that quote, it just totally is right on. 
Okay, moving right along. Um, sorry. Libby. I already had a chance to share. Oh, I'm sorry, you did. You, your <laughs> photo adjusted and so I, I got all messed up. Uh, Andrew, have you shared? I don't think you have. I'm willing to share. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> yes, we hear you. Yep. Um, I'm really passionate about conversations and I've noticed way back that um, having conversations about systemic change is like asking people to play metal chess. There's just a lot to keep in mind and people may nod and act as though they're following the conversation, but actually not. And thinking about that, I picked up a tip from a corporate trade show pitchman who had been a former stage magician. And he said, give people something physical to hang your ideas on. So with that idea, I made a set of physical markers uh, that can be used in conversations that help people can kind of lay out the system's connections and people can talk about and discuss or their one specific point, but having the whole picture in mind. So it's a way of moving people from uh, silo thinking to seeing the big picture, uh, but also not getting lost in that. So that's written up in something called tabletop presentations that I'm now in the process of producing the physical models so that people around the world can get them. So that's what's hot with me about, um, ah, but then the next question is, uh, if we see the need for many, many conversations that help people come to grips with their feelings has been talked about and get to the level of whole system change, the question becomes, how can we get millions of people doing this? So my vision of that is, what if we could catalyze not just a few groups in talking about systemic change, because there are a few groups, but all the different groups that Naomi Klein is referring to and that Paul Hawken refers to, well, not all, but many of them, to act as citizen educators, um, using tools of various sorts to uh, engage with people who haven't thought much about our dilemmas and the hopeful possibilities. So that's it. Thank you, Andrew. Okay, so I'm needing some help with uh, some of the people that might just be on phone. Have I missed anyone? Yes, this is David on the phone. David, thank you. Um, what I've noticed, my friends, in the last couple of months um, the month leading up to the Paris talks and the time since and during the talk, that um, some, some things have become apparent to me. Um, maybe that I was blind to them. And basically there's three things. One is I believe we're going to see more and more confrontations, um, perhaps more with the politicians who are in the pockets of the fossil fuel industry. Um, but I believe that these barriers uh, are very surmountable, and I'll tell you why I think they're surmountable, and, I, and I'm really hopeful and, and actually joyous because I think that we're, we're willing now to take risks. We're willing to speak truth to power. We're willing to speak up, and I've noticed more persons who are willing to, to speak their mind without fear. Um, and I think they're speaking their mind without fear because they're speaking from the heart. Um, they're using passion, which is something that they own. And I, and I think it's very beautiful and it's encouraging. The other point is that um, I believe that there's a lot of hope that people will say, people are listening to me. That there's a hope that we are speaking from a high moral plane and that people are interested in hearing what we're saying. It's an optimistic feeling that I, I seem to be noticing that more and more people are willing to say, listen, I think I have something here. Let me share with you and I'm not afraid to share it. So this is something that has become apparent to me more and more. It's given me strength because I call around the state to encourage folks to become more involved with their congressional um, districts and I'm finding such a positive response 
In other words, it seems that fear is um, melting away. So that's something I wanted to share with you, my friends, the, the positiveness that I, that I see, even in the midst of confrontations. Great. Thanks, David. Am I missing anyone? Has everyone had a chance to at least uh, speak once? I'll just put my two cents worth in. Um, ah, so many things that have occurred to me from everything everyone said. Uh, I jumped into this um, about a year ago after reading Naomi's book. Um, I had been interested in sustainability for some time, but I hadn't really been focused using my facilitation skills until about a year ago. And when I started to want to work in the field, it just seemed like every time I brought up climate change to people I knew and loved, eyes would roll. I mean, I know we've all gotten this before, but... I think from one year to now, things are shifting just in general. And now when I bring up climate change, I'm doing work in climate change, just in normal everyday conversation, I don't get that overwhelmed. I don't get the eyes rolling anymore. So I know something has shifted. There, there really has been a, a movement, a collective movement, uh, that makes conversation about climate a little bit easier to have, at least for me. Um, one thing that's got my attention is I recently looked at a video by Kevin Anderson, uh, I know he's mentioned quite often in Naomi's book. Um, he's an economist that does a lot of scenario work. And he gave this talk in Iceland, and he made the point that most of what the politicians get, even from the top scientists and the top economists, are still watered down. Even people, I'm not talking necessarily like James Hansen, but, but people who are advising our policymakers, they're not giving them the real um, seriousness, um, of the real dilemma. They're using even wrong statistics. It's kind of scary. But the, the more important point he made, which is impacting my work now, is that if we were to just take the 10% of the West that's developed, those of us at the upper income levels, I think some of us have mentioned that, if we were to just reduce our carbon footprint, it would go so far. It would go so far to helping us move away from a pretty disastrous situation. So on that note, I have been um, very diligent at this idea of working at a neighborhood level. Um, one thing I'm doing is I found a group here in Tucson that is called the Resilient Neighborhood Program. And their approach has been to use emergency preparedness as a doorway in to building cohesion in neighborhoods. Because research has found that the more cohesive neighbors are, the better they can withstand um, any sort of climate or um, emergency situation in Tucson. If we had a major power outage in the summer, you can imagine we have a very um, elderly population here. People will die. So I'm using that as a springboard to go in after we do emergency preparation work to take those same neighbors that have already been organized and to start climate conversation work. The two, the two things that I'm looking at uh, one of them comes out of the Transition Town Movement. It's called Transition Streets. They've just begun to launch it. It's a six-week program that looks at water and carbon and all the ways that we as individuals can actually do something. And there's another um, resource in uh, the UK called Carbon Conversations that I'm quite impressed with. Uh, and they do a lot more with the psychological aspect. So I'm not sure which one I'm going to be using, and it sounds like some of you also are working in that arena, so I'm, I'm quite interested in how we can build cohesion for these kinds of conversations at a neighborhood level where we can all support each other, because I don't think we can make change unless we do it in community. So um, I'm hoping that, um, and I love what you said, Andrew, about citizen educators. I mean, that, that would be fantastic. Once perhaps we ourselves go through a program, we could then start to lead other groups in it, and that's how things spread. So that's my hope. So I'm looking at my, my uh, watch, and it's 4.30. We wanted to start to transition into networking, but I, I think I'm going to hold another 10 minutes, um, and I see Sharon Joy. Yes. We haven't heard from Bora, I don't believe, in this round. Bora, have you not gotten, gotten your in for the second round? I'm, I'm new. I was muted there. Um, no, I didn't, but it was because I didn't really, I had thoughts on earlier ideas and didn't really have much to uh, you know, add to the conversation, other than probably to say that from 
So I come from this sort of environmental education perspective. So obviously education is a big part of what I care about and think is a, an important piece in our being able to address climate change and other environmental and social ills. And I am constantly um, confronted, I guess, with the you know, sort of notions one of the one of the earlier people said, how do you move forward when it never stops? And that, that notion of of hope and how do you keep people hopeful and moving forward and understanding, having self efficacy that what they do matters. And that's something that we confront all the time within education and trying to especially when you're working with um, people who are under eighteen years old, worrying about um making sure that they don't worry too much, that they don't get into the dooms, you know, that there is going to be no future. Our, you know, our, you've, you all have destroyed it all for us, and there is no future out there. Um, and so that notion of trying to cast, um, cast a lot of this work under uh, a delicate balance of hope a delicate balance of motivation and a couple of the people have talked about some of these these ideas of that you might have deniers or you might have people who don't feel much hope or they don't feel much sense that what they can do matters in a big picture um, but casting it under the well you don't have to believe in climate change but do you want to save money you know, if you do this, you're going to save money. You don't have to believe in, you don't have to believe that your, your drip in the bucket is going to actually make a difference, although I think it will, um, because it's going to make a difference in your own life. It's going to bring joy to your life. It's going to bring uh, satisfaction to your life. It's going to bring economic benefits to your life. It's going to bring uh, community to your life. So trying to find those other ways of getting people to engage it. So that seems to be really um, a big sort of issue or, or conundrum to me um, and something we work on a lot. Another sort of whole conundrum, um, there was a bit of a discussion around the notion of systemic change and I tend to think in terms of the environment as this incredibly complex set of systems and systems nested within systems and get lost immediately, and most people do. But on the other hand, you if you don't think of it as a system, you're more likely to pull a thread that in the end may unravel something. Um, or it's not doing what you're hoping it's going to end up doing. So the, the notion of systems and trying to help people start to really think in terms of the, the systems of their lives, the, the social systems we have, the economic systems, all the, the previous conversations around um, environmental justice and climate justice and um, social justice are all part of systems as well as understanding more about the um, climate systems, because one of the one of the problems that I see is that people will believe in their heart of hearts, and they're motivated by all the right stuff, but they believe in their heart of hearts that they are making a difference, and in reality, what they're choosing to do is really not addressing the real problem because they don't understand anything about the system. And so a, a big challenge in my world is in how, how, much, how much of that understanding of a system do people really need um, in order to make good decisions. And I guess that ties into one other little thought was that um, certainly within my work and the work of others that, that I deal with all the time, when when you when you work in education you're always it's long term you're rarely ever really thinking about tomorrow 
um, or today. You're always thinking 10 years from now, 20 years from now. So as an environmental educator, my concern isn't so much, frankly, what a 10-year-old or a 20-year-old is going to know and do right now. It's sort of, yeah, that's important, but it's like what are they going to do 10 years from now or 20 years from now? That 10-year-old 10 years from now votes. That 10-year-old now, 20 years from now, has kids and gets married and does the rest of stuff in life. So it's really all that long-term and so much of climate change and other environmental and social issues are really about that long-term perspective. It's, it's a crisis now, but, and we need to do things now, but if we don't always look to that horizon, we're likely, I think, to have more unintended consequences than intended ones. And it's a, it's a balance there. Um, so I think that with that, I will end. <laughs> Thanks, Laura. I'm so sorry I didn't catch you. No That's problem. So um, I'm looking again at my, my watch, and we wanted to give some time for networking, but I'm wanting just a show of hands quickly if there's something that you would really like to put into the circle before we end this dialogue. I, uh, I'd like to know, and we can just spend maybe a few minutes. So if there's any just last-minute things you'd just really like to say, just give me a little hand raise. Otherwise, I'm going to give it over to Sharon Joy, and we're going to go right into uh, networking. Thank you so much. I wish we had more time. I would have loved to have taken this uh, further. Uh, everyone's comments were just so uh, heartfelt. Thank you. Sharon sure Joy. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, just such respect for each of you and what you're doing and what you're kind enough to share with us today. We wanted to give time for announcements for possibilities to connect um, a little bit of today. We, how could we be running out of time when we set aside two hours, but we have. Ben was uh, uh, set that model up front where he announced the group that he's having in the next couple of days. Are there any other announcements um, that people want to put out or a, a place to gather besides the Ning site this, this evening? And I'll just put it out as if you have something to say, wave your hand or a finger. And uh, okay, looks like Linda's up first. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that because I'm moving into this project area around um, working with our public utility here, I'm going to start a subgroup around uh, that subject. So I love anyone who's working in that area to join me, please. And maybe we could share some resources. I'm beginning to pick up some things and I'd love to see what else other people are doing. Great. Rosa, you had your hand up. This is not a, a, a resource. It's a, it's a request. Just um, if people could take a minute or two to just look through the chat, especially if you shared some resources. Uh, you know, we were capturing what we could, but if there's things that you would like to add to it, titles of specific books, of specific people that are resources, et cetera, we will be saving the chat afterwards and looking through it and uh, harvesting from it in a slightly more organized way. But any information that you want to add there would be most welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Rosa, Rosa, could I add to that? As you raise your hand with an event or project you want to share, after that, could you just turn right around and put it into the chat as well? <laughs> Thanks. Very good. We're trying to, so hard to be a collective intelligence. So raise your hand. Anybody else? Hello, this is Andrew Gaines. Uh, don't good. Have Michael, take yourself off. Michael, you're on, you're on uh, mute. There. Good. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to mention a... a conference that uh, I'm working on developing, in fact, uh, working with Sharon Joy, I hope, in, in pulling this together, on the 31st of January, after a um, interfaith climate conference in Orlando, the 28th, 29th, and 30th of January, on the 31st, uh, I'm hoping to pull together a 
I'm calling an assembly, a three or four hour get together from people around that area that tentatively is, is titled Communities of Faith and Ethical Convictions Can Reverse Climate Change. Uh, trying to make that a pretty provocative title, uh, but uh, that's hope to get more information about that out very soon. Thanks. Okay. Sharon, I'd like a chance. Andrew here. Andrew, please step up. Right, so I've been working on this space for probably a decade, and I'm with Be the Change Australia, a small NGO, um, and we're organizing what I'm calling Inspiring Transition Initiative. And the idea is to, uh, as I mentioned earlier, get thousands of groups championing whole system change to a life sustaining society, join a message language get thousands of groups working as citizen educators um, and provide them the conversation tools that I mentioned earlier, though they're not the only ones. So my request is that I'd love to have any of you um, have an offline chat with me and consider how we might collaborate to move this from the current um, early prototype stage to an actual global movement for consciousness shifting. So that's my request. Thank you, Andrew, and let me encourage you and others to consider posting that request on Ning, the subgroups. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, there's Marty. Hi, Marty. Great, I remembered to unmute. I Just a couple quick things. I did start a group on Ning for other, I know that there's at least a couple of others in our emerging network here that are active in citizen climate lobby. So I'm trying to have us identify ourselves there. And also, if there's any of you that want to learn more about that group and what it's doing, I would welcome any conversation on that. But um, So that's one thing. And then secondly, I just wanted to mention that next month, I am taking the lead and our team will be focusing on having our two-hour discussion be post-Paris kind of after a time of digestion from Paris, where do things stand? And I think the threads are looking at what did we learn about processes in Paris? What did we learn about our work um, from, or how is our work informed by what went on in Paris? Those are a couple of the threads that we want to discuss. I would welcome here just if anyone has a, maybe a few people might have quick reactions for me. Um, one option we're considering is having maybe a couple people, for example, I know someone, I know a number of people who were in Paris who could talk about the citizen engagement activities that were going on and some of the other initiatives that were going on. So one scenario would be to have kind of a little bit of a very short, maybe a 10 minute overview from someone that was in Paris that touches on some of the issues of concern to us as a springboard for then us having a conversation where we introduce our own knowledge and our own thoughts, or we could just go straight conversation. So this is kind of a two-part thing. If, if anyone has a strong reaction either way to whether we have uh, one or two people that warm us up with some firsthand accounting, I'd like to hear from you. Um, and maybe you could, maybe in the spirit of time, you could respond to me offline. I'll put it in the chat. Um, and secondly, if any of you know of someone that was in Paris that might be good if we do decide to go in that direction to be one of the people that could um, speak to some of the issues of how processes were operating in Paris around the negotiation and the civil society, as well as what we now as climate change activists um, are taking away from what Paris means for our work. Thank you. Very good. Thanks, Marty. Anybody else? Hi, Hi, this is Leanne. I can wait for the next person, though. I guess someone else is coming up. Go ahead, Leanne. Okay, this is just quick, but it came out today. Um, I'll post the link. The um, Yale uh, Center for Climate Change Communication is always doing a lot of good um, evidence-based work, and the most recent one today is called Public Opinion in the Environment, the Nine Types of Americans. So we all have our different lenses in which we view the folks with whom we're working. I find that their work is helpful to understand from a specific um, 
view how people are holding these various feelings and opinions about environmental work specifically. They've done lots of good stuff on climate change, but I'll post this link now. Um, and it's quite fascinating because it's far more nuanced than what we might pick up um, from other sources. Thank you so much, Leanne. Libby, I think you wanted to speak, please. Yeah, uh, well, thanks for that, Leanne. That's awesome. I'm really looking forward to seeing that. Um, I just wanted to mention, and I did put something on the chat about it, and a bunch of you probably know about it, but there is this resource called Open Educational Resources, also sometimes referred to as the Creative Commons, where people are able to put their work out into the world, give people the right to use a copyrighted material, to take it, use it full on, to take it and mix it with other things, to adapt it as they need to. You just need to give credit usually to the source, and it's usually non-commercial. You can check it out further. But I'm really hoping that people are going to start posting a whole host of resources up there because we need to move so fast. Um, you know, we can't be sending them individually through channels, but just putting up textbooks, putting up reports, putting up research, putting up dialogue ideas, putting up whatever they've got. So just keep that in mind if you've never heard of it. I'm just new to it myself. But if you look up Creative Commons or Open Educational Resources, you may find things already on climate emergency stuff, and we can post them. Thanks. Excellent. Thanks. And they could be used by people around the world. Ben, are you trying to uh, speak to us? Jim is. Oh, okay, Jim. <clears throat> I just wanted to uh, <clears throat> recommend a book called The Systems View of Life uh, by Capra and Luisi. Uh, it's a textbook and it's fabulous uh, review of systems theory in all its complexity. Uh, but it focuses in on living systems, the ones we're talking about. Thank you. Excellent. Ben, did you disappear? Uh, you weren't open. Can we hear from you? Do you hear me now? There you go. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, just a quick plug for the film Merchants of Doubt. I put the link in there. It's documentary. Fabulous. And one of those ones where, um, like certain books, it's like you really want to show the denier or the people that are sort of wishy-washy uh, this and see what they, you know, how they react. So, um, you know, as a conversation starter, highly, highly recommended. Thanks, great idea. Anybody else? Linda. Linda. Just very quickly, I know um, Mike Huggins couldn't be with us, but he has started another group on faith-based faith communities, and that will be our topic in February. So if any of you are working in that arena, you might want to join his group, and we might want uh, you to play a you know special role when we have that uh, that conversation in February. Great announcement. Um, we did have to lose Rick along the way, and um, I think does anybody else have a comment? Oh, yeah, there you are. Come on, Libby. Sorry again. Um, also, again for research-based stuff, there is an organization called Frameworks. I put this on the chat. Um, they got a MacArthur grant, as far as I know, for their work, so I assume it's highly credible. And they do research on a host of things in terms of public conversations, and they have um, information about how best to speak to people about climate change. Um, so it's worth looking it up. Thanks. Thank you. Well, so, um, Sharon Joy, if everyone's complete on that, um, Nancy, I'm going to turn it over to you. We're just going to talk very briefly about Ning. We have a few minutes left and uh, very few, but we have a few. So Nancy, take it away. Yeah, I will make it really short. I've been, everyone around me has been talking about me and I found myself avoiding it and not doing anything with it. And I have committed the next day or so to finally get in there and do my profile. And I realized part of my own resistance was the feeling that I want to be writing coherent material that I can get out, it'll be really useful. And scattering my writing energies across a half dozen or two dozen social websites and repeating myself all the time. And even within our Ning site, having them all over the place just did not seem to me like what I wanted to do. But I've had kind of a conversion experience in the last day or two. As I'm listening to, for example, our conversation today, 
our mentioning our resources, the sense of using the Ning site as a place not only to make comments and answer questions others have asked for us, but to start to use it to weave together, to map out together what's going on, who's where, where are the natural connections between us, what are the synergies and work we could do together, and have a place. Um, it's interesting you should ask that, Michael, because just after your comment before, I was going to ask Linda or someone to put a link in for Ning with a little note as to what it is. It's Right now, it is the platform that is supporting these conversations. And our hope is that without turning this into a text uh, process rather than the lively conversations we're having, to use it as a support and backup and way to make connections. A flash for me was when Marty at one point said to me, look, you make a great comment in a conversation or you send out something really cool on email and I'm struck by it, but it's, it's gone. It's lost forever. I can't get back to it and I can't review it to make, to connect it up with other things. So Ning is our still evolving, still figuring out how to do this effort to create a place to capture our work in words a little more systematically. And for example, if you're reaching out and want to, have conversation with others here on a particular topic that was raised, or you have a group you want to create around a project that you're involved in, there's a forums where you can just get a conversation going. And there is, I'm forgetting right now what the other section is called, but a place to form new, new groups, essentially focused on some common task. There's already one there, as Sharon Joy has mentioned. I, I think you were, may have been the one that set it up, Sharon, on um, the interest in interfaith uh, organizing in connection with climate change. So it, Linda will put it in the, in the chat, and I think we're going to attempt to keep, to put the link to it in each of our outgoing emails. And you can, if you're in it, you can set it up so that whenever somebody in a group you're in a conversation with makes a new comment, you also get an email notification. So it gives us that kind of connection, but keeps it all in one place where we can accumulate knowledge together. And the last point is, if you've got some serious writing or other sources of your own elsewhere, you don't want to repeat it here. You can just link to it and stay in the conversation that way. That's it. Oh, there is, no, there is one other thing. I'm sorry. It's not quite it. If you have questions about it, or even better, comments or suggestions on how to improve it, and we are looking for better platforms that do this job better, please um, let us know. You can either do it in this chat message or in an email to the hosting team. Thanks. Anyone else want to add anything or ask questions? Marty. I just wanted okay. to say, I just realized in the, there's also, there's a resources section where you can, you can set up a, a new subject group. There's also forums, which are topical discussions. And I just set up a forum today. I'll put it in chat on post Paris. And okay. I put in that one article that was bouncing around the NCDD listserv on the, um, the Indaba process, the, the process that the negotiators used, the South African process. But, but that could be a repository also for us to share information and insights um, post-Paris, kind of how things are digesting and what we're thinking. That's in the forums on Ning. And I just wanted to mention, um, there's really, other than the group, the group, the group section is where you have a special... Uh, group that you'd like to form like a subgroup. It's fairly straightforward once you go in there You can start a new group how to do that and walk you through it If you have a long piece put it in the blog section if you have resources to share for right now Put it in the blog section if you want to start a conversation use the forum And if you want to follow conversations at the very bottom of something that's been started You can uh, hit the follow button and that's how you'll know someone has responded to whatever is being um, emailed or texted about. So just uh, let you know some of that. 
Um, so we have about four minutes, and I'm just wondering if we all want to just uh, maybe say one sentence and just go around quickly. Um, we can just um, let's let's do that popcorn style, and I'm just going to call it when it comes time. So any closing comments? Keep them short. The floor is open. Ms. Andrew, I think we have a very exciting group. I'm thrilled. Thanks. I like, this is Marty, I like the phrase, the long emergency. Mm. <laughs> this is Leanne. Yeah. I hope that we recognize the need to continuously cycle into extreme activism during these long emergency, but also to take the time and the space to refresh and restore ourselves so that we are in a condition to actually serve the people that we're working with and serve our own needs as well. This is David in Tampa. Um, my comment is that I found it difficult to harvest what we were talking about, perhaps because we were speaking uh, on numerous subjects. So it was difficult for me to harvest it, but it was still beautiful. This is Michael. I'd just like to say thank you for allowing me to join at this last minute. I had never heard of this until this morning, and this has been the most stimulating discussion, conversation with all sorts of possibilities opening up. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Grady, I've enjoyed uh, experiencing further evidence that everything is, in fact, connected. This is Ben. Uh, I'm reminded of something someone says in a, in a group gathering in 2010 that it's, it's going to take a miracle for us to get through this interlocking set of crises that we see. And then he broke down in tears and, and told an amazing story of how he witnessed a miracle that was essentially the birth of, of Greenpeace as a nonprofit that wouldn't exist today if this miracle hadn't have happened. So I'll tell you the story some other time. <laughs> This is Rosa. I'm just really appreciating the learning, the inspiration, and the connections that happen when we create spaces to share from the heart. Thank you. This is Nancy, and I'll comment that um, if things went as planned, this conversation was recorded. We intended to tell you that before we started but we didn't. Um, if it's recorded, the plan is not to put it on the internet or put it out there, but to invite you, if you have need of it, want to go back and catch part of it, or process the whole thing all over again, to let Linda know, and we'll arrange it on an as-needed or case-by-case -case basis. It also means that it just occurred to me, if we created for each call a volunteer harvesting team who would go back for that call and try to hard organize the high points and then put that into Ning, it might help with the comment that was just made. And further thought I've had, we've had more people wanting to come into this conversation than we've had space for. And I'm assuming and hoping that that will grow. Now we can do spin-offs, spin-off groups, and that definitely should go that way. But it occurs to me that if we have the first 20 people who sign up be part of the active conversation, we could open up an audio space for everyone else to listen in and maybe write in chats on comments they want to make and thereby bring that more, many more people into this process and I've been a little disheartened at times you know what it's like to be on a hosting team and all the problems behind the scenes but I am so jazzed today I hardly know what to do I'm out anyone else well just to that last point I, I'm 
I'm pretty sure Zoom accounts now, the basic account gives you up to 50 people on a call. And breakouts, I know, are now also a standard part of what you can do in Zoom. So they get in the larger groups. Um, we should be able to design something that works. Yes, yes. We're, we're on, I think we're going to have some conversations about that coming up uh, just on Thursday. So I just want to say that this has just been such um, a meaningful conversation for me. It makes me feel not so alone to know that you all are here <laughs> and you're, we're all doing similar work and that, that everyone's getting on, on board. You know, I, I saw this video last night of Naomi and what struck me was when someone said, well, you know, what can we do? This is horrible. And she just, she just plowed right through it by saying every hand needs to be on deck because once you get on deck, and this is what I found out, it's fun. It's fun to be with you all. So on that note, thank you all for showing up and we'll see you hopefully next month. Thank you. <laughs> Great work. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Hope Thank to see some of you on Thursday. Yes. Yes, I'm going to be there. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to be there too, Ben. Sure. It's a great oh. topic, Ben. Thank you. Uh, I, uh, well, really looking forward to it. Bye. Bye. Well, hey, everybody. Do we want to talk just for a few? Oh, here we are. Here we are. I know I need a quick bio break. break. Um, might be useful just to spend 10 minutes quick process. Shall we do that? Let's, let's do a bye break and come back. Just keep on. Okay. Hey, Nancy. Oh, well, what did you think? Oh, uh, you're on mute, Nancy. So, how did everybody think it went? I'm so glad, Rosa, now you took notes. There were so many things. So many things. Oh, and I need to stop the recording. Let's do that.